Hi everyone, I'm Gina Chavez at the Center for Public Policy Priorities and welcome to Point of Order, a video series where we are highlighting um, what should be at the top of our legislators' agendas. In this episode, we're going to talk about Medicaid and why capping funds on any level is bad for Texans. Here to talk more with me and uh, dive into the details is our associate director and renowned Medicaid expert, Ann Dunkelberg. Welcome, Ann. Thanks, Gina. All right. So to kick it off, you know, people may not realize how important health care is. Um, is as a policy item for the center. Um, you know, in 1985, we were actually founded by the Benedictine Sisters of Bernie, and it was precisely because they saw a need to expand access to healthcare in Texas. And so I thought we might just start there briefly to, to give people a background on what healthcare and access to healthcare means for us at the center. Yeah, we are not uh, at the center focused on you know, the best kind of medicine that people need to get are clinical issues or traditional public health. We are really approaching it from a social justice issue. And the sisters knew that if you didn't have access to decent, affordable health care, you really didn't have access to the American dream. Let's go ahead and dive in. And what are Medicaid block grants and per capita caps? Well, the problem with uh, Medicaid block grants and per capita caps, and it's so important because this is part of the current national debate about what's going to happen with Medicaid, uh, is that they potentially leave Texas in a position where we literally don't have enough money to take care of the folks we're taking care of today, much less take care of the millions of remaining uninsured in Texas. Uh, my favorite pie charts over my shoulder. Uh, I won't. I won't make you read through it. But one of the things that I discover all the time lately is that so many people uh, who I would think would know don't know some of the basic things about Medicaid. So just to tick off, we have over three million Texas children getting Texas Medicaid today. And when you add in a much smaller number, around 375,000 kids getting CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program that's like 45% of the children in the state are relying on these programs. Another thing that, that I've heard people be shocked about is that more than half of the babies delivered in Texas are delivered by Medicaid. And two thirds of the people who are in nursing homes are being paid for by Medicaid. So while a lot of people think Medicaid doesn't touch their life and they don't need to worry about it, it's huge. Let's dive a little further into why this isn't great for Texas. Yeah. I'm gonna try to stay out of the weeds as much as I can, which you know isn't easy for me, but I'm gonna try. And so the big picture with the block grant is uh, that it is basically handing over to the state a fixed amount of money. And it's basically saying, you know, after this year, we don't care how many people show up and qualify for this program, this is all the money you're gonna get. Where well, you may get an inflation update, but you're not gonna get an increase for enrollment. And what that means is your state is susceptible to not having enough money to take care of people if there's an epidemic, not enough money if there's a natural disaster, and not enough money if there's a recession. And we have had all of those just in the last 15 years in Texas. A lot of people get that a block grant is dangerous. They can see the risk and they also can see that every other health and human service block grant that Congress has had over the last 30 years, they've let just slump mm. uh, to where they no longer provide nearly the services they used to. So people in Congress are starting to put that together and the general public too. And, and as a way of backing off of the block grant, they said, okay, let's talk about a per capita cap. And it is absolutely true that that's not as bad, but it still creates a lot of problems. So instead of saying, here's what you spent in 2019, that's all you get from now on, no, no enrollment growth, they say, okay, we're gonna let you have enrollment growth, but we're still gonna pick a year and it's probably a year that's already passed, and we're gonna look at how much you spent per person in that year, and then we're gonna cap how fast that can grow. So you can add new people, but if for some reason the cost to take care of a child, or the cost to take care of a senior, or the cost to take care of a Texan with disability, if that goes up intensely, we're off the hook as, the, as Congress and as the federal government, and you're on your own to take care of any additional costs of that. So that's the first problem, is you can still not really have enough money to take care of the needs of your folks anymore. The second problem becomes, if they freeze us in at some year in the past, like 2016 is one of the ones they're talking about, you're freezing in place 
every decision that your legislature has ever made about your Medicaid program. Most of those are driven by the budget, not by what makes sense for health care. Mm -hmm. And so some of them are random and some of them people would even agree are bad. So far, the proposals we see always use a year that's in the past, precisely because they don't want states to go in and fix things uh, that will result in more federal funding. The point of these bills that Congress is putting forward is to reduce federal spending to the states. And the most recent example we have, uh, the most recent CBO score we have for a bill in Congress would cut Medicaid spending to the states by $880 billion over 10 years. It's a very big reduction. And I think one of the things that as advocates for access to health care, we usually want to say when we hear that is what is it that you want to change? Who do you want to give fewer services to? What services do you want to reduce? Uh, we already have a very lean Medicaid program in Texas and you know not a lot of bells and whistles so um, we are you know basically texas has plenty of latitude to do more things and to do innovative things already so the only flexibility that you are getting under these federal proposals is you know basically at a price of really risking that you literally don't have enough money to deal with basic health care needs it's also very different in different parts of Texas. It's really important to understand that if you were living in the Rio Grande Valley, there are counties here where 75% of the children are covered by either Medicaid or CHIP. Wow. So you're not going to find a pediatrician down in the valley who doesn't take Medicaid or CHIP. That's, you know, that is the way you do business. But in other parts of Texas, it can be really tough to find a provider. It's more important than ever to speak up on these issues. Again, uh, you know, even if you don't personally know somebody who's been affected by Medicaid, uh, you're probably, you know, not not very separated from those folks. And this support is huge for keeping, you know, the major safety net hospitals, the trauma care centers that we all rely on open. Uh, it's going to have ripple effects through our economy if we have a major loss of funding in our Medicaid program. So no, none of us would escape uh, being affected by these changes and, uh, and hopefully a lot of us care about the people who are affected even if they aren't uh, in our immediate families. The center participates in Cover Texas Now, which is a coalition of uh, mostly consumer-facing and faith-based groups that are working on access to health care. Uh, you can link to them from our website, you can Google Cover Texas Now and get involved there. But there's tons of other organizations that are advocating on healthcare too. So if you're already affiliated, you know, with some uh, activist group, whether it's Indivisible or Move On, uh, or or just as a member of a faith-based network, um, there are a lot of different ways to engage. But anybody who's watching this and doesn't know how to get engaged, we really encourage you to obviously get on the the centers, you know, email list so that you get all of our updates. But also go to Cover Texas Now where you can get uh, involved in our, our advocacy efforts and find out what's happening around the state. Thanks everyone. For more information on Medicaid block grants, per capita caps, and um, healthcare information, please check out our website at cppp.org, that's cppp.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And um, as always, you can look to us for the latest on what's happening at the Texas legislature. Thanks.